Super. Well, uh, we've got a really great turnout. So thanks to everybody for participating and thanks also to our speakers. We have a wonderful lineup that I'll introduce to you in a few minutes. Uh, first, what I'd like to do though, is welcome you to our webinar, Honoring World Environment Day. Uh, this is the very first open webinar that we've held uh, as the UNESCO Chair on Food Biodiversity and Sustainability Studies. I'm really delighted uh, to share uh, this time with you. Uh, this is part of a series of three annual webinars that we'll be doing, um, hosted by the UNESCO Chair on Food Biodiversity and Sustainability Studies. Um, the next one will be in the fall uh, for World Food Day, and we'll do another one uh, next spring again uh, uh, for World Biodiversity Day. And we'll probably do more in the interim, but those are the uh, standing webinars that we'll hold every year. Uh, and just a couple of uh, housekeeping details uh, before we get started. Because there are so many people on the call, we're going to ask you for bandwidth reasons to turn off your video unless you're speaking, which means just the panelists need to have their videos on. Also to mute your mics, please. And uh, there is a chat bar. So if you have a question that you'd like uh, to pose to one of the panelists or as part of the discussion afterwards, uh, please put that in the chat bar and we'll make sure that you get heard that way. So before we get started, I'd just like to set the context for why it's important to think about sustainable food systems as we're thinking about the environment. So the, um, one of the pressing concerns, beg your pardon, one of the pressing concerns is uh, around the issue of uh, biodiversity. And biodiversity uh, loss is both caused by and also impacts food production. As you can see on the slide, 75% uh, of the land and related ecosystems have been altered by human action, including more than 35% by agriculture. And one of the effects of this is to put approximately $570 billion in crops at risk every year to, due to um, pollinator loss. And this has the knock-on effect of reducing food pro productivity potentially by 23%. We also know that there are significant community well-being challenges. So when we're thinking about sustainability, we're looking at the three pillars, the environment, society, and also um, the economy. So in terms of community well-being, even though there's enough food in the world for everybody um, to eat a healthy diet, there are more than 820 million people who are food insecure, and this has been seriously exacerbated by conditions under the COVID pandemic. Uh, we also know that poor nutrition causes 45% of deaths in children under five worldwide, and also that there's a big difference in terms of poverty rates between rural and urban areas, with them being three times higher in, in uh, rural settings. We also know that uh, the food system is very closely linked to greenhouse gas emissions with up to 37% of uh, the global food system contributing uh, to greenhouse gas emissions through uh, the improper disposal of food waste, uh, deforestation, and also chemical use and transportation of food. So with that big overview in mind, uh, I'm going to turn all of this over to our wonderful panel. I'm so delighted uh, to welcome Sebastian Goupy from the Canadian Commission for UNESCO, where he is the Secretary General. Uh, we're also very uh, pleased to have Liette Besser, who's the president for CC UNESCO and also a professor at Brock University with us today. Andre uh, Lacerda from Embrapa Forestry and Eve Nimmo will be talking, uh, Eve is from Ponto Grassi uh, State University and they'll be both be talking about uh, sustainable food systems and agroforestry in Brazil. And Andrew Spring, the Associate Director for the Laurier Center for Sustainable Food Systems at Wilfrid Laurier University is gonna be talking about food in the Northwest Territories. So uh, Sebastian, if I can ask you to get us started to give a, a, a big sort of picture overview of the environment and biodiversity, that would be awesome. Excellent, thanks, uh, Lisa. Hello, everyone. Uh, it's a real pleasure to join you today to mark uh, World Environment Day. I'd like to thank Alison and her team at the UNESCO Chair on Food Biodiversity and Sustainability Studies for this kind invitation to say a few introductory remarks. 
I have to admit that uh, World Environment Day has a special significance this year. Uh, as you may know, the pandemic is disrupting international plans to advance very critical discussions relating to biodiversity, the theme for 2020. And we know how imperative it is to bring uh, world leaders, including here in Canada, to commit to fast, concrete and very bold actions. One could ask why we should care about biodiversity. And I thought I would paraphrase Damian Carrington, the uh, environment editor at The Guardian. Uh, he says that biodiversity represents the variety of life on Earth in all its forms and interactions. It is the most complex and vital feature of our planet. Put in simple uh, terms, our capacity to breathe, drink clean uh, water, and eat quality food ultimately rely on biodiversity and the complex and fragile ecosystems uh, that support it. But unfortunately, we know that the future of life and humanity is currently at stake because we continue to destruct and disrupt ecosystems at alarming rates. The Amazon rainforest is currently a tragic symbol of this. We also know that ecosystems and biodiversity are profoundly impacted by climate change. And the report uh, that uh, we've all seen, the 2019 report by the Intergovernmental Science Policy Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services, clearly states that world ecosystems and biodiversity are showing the rapid decline. And this means that globally, uh, local varieties and breeds of domesticated plants and animals are disappearing, and that this loss of diversity, including genetic one, is currently posing a serious risk to global food security by undermining the resilience of many agricultural systems. The good thing, because I like to look at the positive side of things, is that the report and organizations like UNESCO that we represent, the United Nations Educational, Scientific and Cultural Organization, are also telling our world leaders that it is not too late. We can all work together from local to global to introduce transformative changes, including through a complete shift of values, paradigms, and uh, priorities. And this is exactly what I'm trying to do in my role as Secretary General of the Canadian Commission for UNESCO. I'm working alongside our members and partners to provoke needed reflections and bring about systemic changes, the ones that are essential to fight climate change, protect our environment, and preserve the broadest forms of biocultural diversity. And we have the enormous privilege of working with a network of innovative UNESCO research uh, chair holder like Alison and our president, Liad Vassar. They are exploring how we use research and build partnerships to build a more resilient and sustainable world. We can also build on the efforts of prestigious designated sites like biosphere regions and global geoparks who uh, mobilize grassroots actors and serve as inspiring example of locally led uh, sustainable development. If there's one thing that I hope you take away from my remark today is that the only way we can make a difference is really to collaborate and work in a very holistic manner across all sectors of our economies and societies. And this is exactly what UNESCO invites us to do. And this is not only about advancing scientific cooperation and promoting, for example, open science, which is a very big priority right now for UNESCO, especially in the context of the pandemic. It's also by mobilizing what the other UNESCO sectors have best to offer. And I wanted to offer a few examples. In education, for example, as a commission, we work to introduce the principles of sustainable development, climate action, reconciliation, and land-based education at the earliest stage uh, through the formal education system and beyond. Through our communication and information sector, we defend the free flow of accurate and reliable information about environmental issues and the importance of biodiversity, including through the professional and independence practice of journalism that is uh, under constant attack throughout the world. In our culture sector, we explore the role culture and arts can play to accelerate the implementation of sustainable development goals, including by connecting people with places and to one another. And uh, through our work in culture, we also promote the role of intangible cultural heritage in building community resiliency, safeguarding precious indigenous knowledges, uh, systems, and languages, 
including those that contribute to preservation of ecosystem and food security. Finally, in our social and human sciences sector, we explore the socioeconomic health and political effect of environmental racism on marginalized, racialized, and indigenous communities with the hope to inform policy making, including at the municipal level uh, through the members of our coalition of inclusive municipalities. Preserving life in all its forms will certainly remain the greatest fight that our humanity will have to wage in the coming uh, decades, but let us never forget our duties and responsibilities towards future generation. It's time to act and I want to thank you all for your ongoing support. Merci, thank you. Merci, Sébastien. That was a wonderful overview and introduction um, that totally sets the context for what we're going to get to hear about now. Uh, and we're going to start off with Liette, who, as I said, uh, Liette Besser is the president for Canadian Commission for UNESCO and also a professor at Brock University. And the rest of the panelists are going to give us some on the ground examples of how uh, change is happening or change is being enabled or traditional or indigenous practices are being revived to help us deal with uh, the many challenges that Sebastian spoke to. So Liette, please, over to you. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you very much. And uh, again, uh, thank you for the invitation to be able to present today. Uh, let me know if you see the screen. It's working? It, it's working, thank you, yeah. Perfect, okay, good. Okay. So um, what I wanted to uh, talk today, and uh, again, Alison, th thanks. Uh, we're both UNESCO chairs uh, and our work are complementing a lot. So this is great to be able to, uh, to enhance collaboration. It's always uh, quite enjoyable. The so uh, quickly, you, we can see the uh, presenter um, slide. So we, we see oh. like the black screen with the two slides. So I don't know if you can switch that around. Okay, okay, just a second. Okay. Do you see the right one now? Oh, probably not, uh, just a second. Okay, I think I know what's happening. No. Okay. Do you see the right one? You bet. Okay, perfect. So, uh, so today I want to discuss a little bit when we talk about the environment about uh, two components for me that are really important to integrate when I work uh, in community sustainability. And I should say I work mostly with rural communities and uh, a big part of my work is on uh, sustainable agriculture. So I'll be talking about uh, the issue of biodiversity, ecosystem services and management, and how does, is it possible to bring that back when we talk about sustainable agriculture? So, okay, for some reason it doesn't want to move. Okay, just a second for some reason. Liet, there's, if you scroll towards the bottom of your screen, there's arrows. There you go. Yeah, 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 it works. It's just that I had another thing open at the same time. Uh, so um, just to, uh, for those who are probably not from uh, the region, uh, so I will be talking about mostly my research being in uh, southern Ontario, more precisely in the Niagara region. Uh, so this is a region where uh, a lot of the agricultural uh, practices are done in Ontario because we have a climate that allows us to be able to grow a, a wide variety uh, of food uh, as well as for the Niagara region in terms of uh, um, vineyards. Before we start, uh, I just want to remind people in terms of biological diversity, its importance uh, and how complex it is when we look at biological diversity. Uh, it's really all the variety of life on earth. And I really like this diagram, infographic, uh, showing that we have species diversity. So the different uh, animal, plants, even microbes that are composing our ecosystem. But we have also within each of them genetic diversity. And this is very important when we look at uh, agriculture because uh, we have uh, different varieties of uh, grapes giving different type of wines. We have different varieties of uh, 
of, uh, for example, brassica, uh, that the same species produce broccoli, cauliflower, rapini, etc. And we have also what we call ecosystem diversity. So giving us uh, what we love to sometimes have as walk, especially now that the parks are coming back, uh, going from forest to woodland to uh, wetlands, for example. And what is important is how this biodiversity is making our ecosystems. And these ecosystems are really, when they function healthy, in a healthy state, they give us goods and services. And these goods and services will provide social, cultural, and economic stability uh, where it is found. So it can be in terms of food, uh, clean water, uh, in terms of pollinators uh, that are going to even pollinate uh, some of our crops, etc. So th these are all components that are very important when we look at our ecosystem. And uh, uh, Sebastian just mentioned uh, the IPES, uh, the Intergovernmental uh, Panel uh, on Ecosystem Services. And, and one, one thing that is important is when we look at ecosystem services, there are many of them. Uh, and there, for a long time, we were talking about supporting, regulating, cultural and provisioning. But gradually over time, and this is something that is more and more accepted, uh, we have been talking more about nature's contribution to people. It talks a lot more about the importance of nature and why humans have to be connected to nature. And, and they are providing many contributions. Uh, here are the main 18 that uh, they are talking about, and they are separated uh, in terms of uh, material that we talk about energy, food, uh, timber, for example, uh, medicinal plants, uh, but they are also non-material that we're talking about recreation, spirituality, um, et cetera, as well as regulating, regulating uh, nature contribution. So habitat creation, pollination, regulation of air quality, climate, et cetera. So these are very important to, to realize uh, why uh, we have to take care of them and why even in, in agricultural rural communities, all these uh, contribution are so important. So in my lab, uh, I, as I said, I work with in sustainable uh, agriculture and we're looking at, at it as a, uh, an ecosystem. So we're looking at the management of the, the ecosystem itself. Uh, for a long time, and still I should say many of my colleagues, uh, when they work uh, on their, uh, their plants, their crop, they work mainly on the main crop. And often we forget all the other interaction that you have in that ecosystem. And, uh, and I see that climate has been uh, removed from my slides for some reason, but it goes from the climate affecting the crop, but it's not only affecting the crop, it's affecting the soil, but the, the soil is affecting also the crop. And all the bi biotic and abiotic uh, traits and diversity that you have in this ecosystem. And that will also be uh, affected or influence either by cover crop or amendment, uh, by the type of management, the market also demand will change this ecosystem as well as social and cultural uh, components. So it's a very complex system uh, that needs to be better understand as a whole instead of just looking at the main crop. So, but there are many challenges that uh, agriculture is facing. Uh, and uh, Alison already mentioned some numbers that are important. Uh, but when we look at uh, other challenges, we have an increasing population. Uh, despite, you know, 3 million tons of pesticide per year, a pest destroy over 40% of the potential global food production. And this is not only in terms of not giving us enough food, but it's all the other consequences in terms of water reuse, water pollution, soil pollution, but also uh, even in terms of human health. 25 million agricultural workers worldwide will experience unintentional pesticide poisoning each year. And I remember working in Burkina Faso, how the uh, farmers of, in cotton fields were telling us their impact at the end. So for a long time, as we have been working uh, in uh, sustainable agriculture, not only here in, in Canada, but in China, Ecuador, and Africa, like Burkina Faso, 
And uh, it brought me to the reflection of the importance of sustainable agriculture. Uh, and that means reestablishing the health of the ecosystem. So we need to better integrate technological, ecological, economic, political health issues that are related to the social ecological system. It's complex, but we need it to be able to go further. So I'll just show a couple of ideas and an example that, uh, that um, this one is from Burkina Faso where we have been uh, working until uh, Unfortunately, the uh, civil unrest started, uh, but um, that is still uh, very important to continue. And I should say, practice it directly at my place at home uh, is what we call the traditional or Sweden or uh, indigenous, in some cases, agriculture. Uh, we have to remember that subsistence agriculture or family or community gardens are something that are very important. Uh, it's true, it's manual labor uh, or with draft animals in most cases, they are small scale farms, but they represent 87% of the world agricultural land. People always think about the large fields of wheat or soybean in uh, the prairies, but we have to remember that pretty much all developing countries will have small scale. And uh, they produce 77% of the major co commodities. There are many sustainable crop management and I just wanted to show you some of them going from minimal no tillage, reduction of nitrogen, intercropping, which we do a lot and cover crop, uh, and the use of natural species that can favor uh, natural enemies. And that brings the idea that we when we look at the ecosystem, we look in fact at its landscape. So not just the field itself, but the rest. And that includes uh, you know, trying to find the different habitats that can promote, uh, for example, pest enemies. And that means also native species, increasing diversity, for example, uh, if a student just finished her master on parameter plantings and the importance for species diversity and pest control. It means, for example, adding strawberries for mites control in vineyards. And that helps because there's another source of run, a revenue. And in our case, we're working also with the industry in terms of uh, looking at other alternatives than chemical fertilizer, like agrominerals, cover crop, and different other things like that. So by the end, the idea that I want you to retain is that if we think about biodiversity, plus sustainable management, plus environmental protection, we hope to get gradually a healthy ecosystem. And through a healthy ecosystem, we can get healthy humans. So thank you very much. This is uh, to open a bit some discussion, I guess. That was amazing. Yeah, thank you so much. It was great to hear about all your work. Um, and I look forward to some questions from, um, from our participants, but uh, I'm gonna turn things over to uh, Eve Nimo from Ponta Grassa University and also and, uh, Andre Lacerda from Embrapa, yeah, both in Brazil, to talk about their work on agroforestry. And Heather will be sharing those slides, so we're good to go. Uh, thank you very much, Allison, for, uh, first of all, for inviting us to present our research here today. Um, I think it's so important to show positive examples from Brazil, uh, considering there's so much negative um, talk about Brazil and the environment. So today we're going to give an example of some of the work that we're doing with small-scale farmers here in Brazil. Um, and I just want to mention that this is a very collaborative project, and so we're here representing our institutions in Brapa and uh, the State University of Ponta Grossa, but it is a very collaborative effort um, with my colleagues from the university and with Andre's colleagues from Embrapa. And some of them are participating in the webinar today, which is great. Um, and also our farmers um, that, that we work with are, are extremely important to the work that we do and they are really partners in this research. Next slide, please. So, so just to give uh, everybody in, uh, the context where we're working, uh, we're working in south, south in Brazil. You can see in the picture or in the map, in the red circle. So specifically in the region, uh, showing the smaller the zoom picture, we have this green area where traditional forest, uh, agroforest systems take place here. The ecosystem here is 
basically co uh, naturally with Agalcaga forest. Agalcaga is the tree that you can see in the picture, it's very iconic, um, but it has the forest and the species. Now, the species nowadays is considered uh, under threat of extinction. Uh, but anyways, it, the forest as a whole in the last 150 years has been reduced dramatically for, uh, because of land conversion into other uses, mostly nowadays uh, commodity agriculture based on soy and some corn. Uh, so we can say that mostly of the original forest has been harvested. Uh, some numbers say about 1%, uh, but we have also 25% uh, of regenerated forests, so secondary forests, they recover over the years. Um, so it's just to show the next slide, uh, slide please. So in this uh, slide, we can see again in the circle where we're working. Uh, so you can see there is a darker green in this area, which means forest. And whatever you see a lighter color of green or a beige color, it means uh, agriculture or other uses the non-natural forest. Uh, so next slide, please. So another overview how the landscape looks like or in the field. Uh, on the top where you see like huge soy plantations, we can see uh, is part of the, most of the state nowadays. Uh, but in the area where we work, we can see very different landscape. So on the bottom left corner, we can see way more forest cover, uh, uh, which means that Exactly in these areas, we still have agroforestry or traditional agroforestry systems where farmers have maintained forests because they use the forest for, the, uh, for various products. So, next slide, please. Um, and so, one of the, the key species that is part of these agroforestry systems on family farms uh, is yerba mate. And for those of you who aren't familiar with yerba mate, it's also called yerba mate uh, in Spanish. And it's a tea that's, that's consumed and it's made from an infusion uh, of the leaves. And it's very popular here in South America and beginning to come, become more popular in Europe and North America, particularly as uh, energy drinks, um, because it does have a high level of caffeine. Um, so similar to coffee plantations, um, uh, the tree grows very well in the, the understory. Um, it's a, so shade-grown aromate is one of the, the best types of aromate. It has a better flavor, it's less bitter, um, and also because it grows within the forest environment, it doesn't require any kind of uh, input such as uh, um, pesticides or fertilizers because of the natural interaction uh, within, within the forest. And so it's an inherently agroecological system. Um, so traditional agroforestry systems are based on this tree within the forest, um, but the majority of, of these small-scale farmers uh, and these on these small-scale farms are a mosaic of a, of a wide variety of different food crops, um, along with agroforestry systems, animal husbandry, uh, and various other kinds of um, subsistence agriculture, but also some commodity agriculture as, as well. And as Liette and, uh, uh, pointed out in her presentation that the majority of landowners in this region are small-scale farmers um, and they produce about 70 percent of the food production in Brazil and in, in the region so they're very important for food security regionally. Um, despite the fact that these traditional systems have continued for generations um, there is a, a lot of pressure to modernize uh, agriculture and to move towards monocultures such as soy and tobacco and corn. Um, and this, there's also a lack of engagement of youth within these traditional systems, which means that they're, they really are being threatened by modernization uh, ideas. Um, so what we're trying to do is to work with these small scale farmers to, to figure out ways to continue traditional systems and also to help them expand across the landscape, which will increase forest cover um, and improve uh, really the, the landscape ecology. Next slide, please. 
Um, so what the, the approach that we're taking is very community based. We're doing a range of different kinds of um, practices and, and methods within uh, the field with our farmers uh, and our partners um, in order to co-create knowledge and share this knowledge. And so we're incorporating traditional ecological knowledge uh, with academic knowledge. And this is mostly done through oral history interviews. So we're interviewing our, the farmers that we work with to, to begin to understand how they perceive the forest, uh, what are the traditional practices that they've used in the past, um, why they've continued to use these practices, how they see the environment and how they understand the importance of forest conservation. Um, and one of the other things that we're doing is trying to leverage grassroots initiatives that have been occurring for, for many generations, for example, heirloom seeds um, that, that these farmers have been collecting and trading um, for, for years. And so leveraging those kinds of activities to support and con continue to value these traditional agroecological practices because they are uh, rich in, in cultural and environmental history and patrimony. Next slide, please. So one of our, uh, one example of the research we're doing um, is the dissemination and testing dissemination on by models of production restoration. So basically we're taking advantage of and leveraging the knowledge that uh, our partners, that our farmers have and trying to build up more uh, productive uh, systems. So what we are, in, in short, what we wanna do is restore the landscape, including more trees, but not only creating forests, they are to, to be pristine because that's an elusive goal. What we want is reintroduce trees and while creating uh, uh, economical alternatives uh, to the farmers. But also by doing that, we are re, uh, increasing biodiversity, biodiversity of species of the, uh, the fauna and the flora. Uh, what we also want to do is implementing systems that are easy for people to understand and, and leverage their so as I said, their knowledge. So by how we do that, we do that by using species that people already know. Uh, we are also doing as creating, trying to create or co-creating systems that are fast. So people don't need to stay, uh, wait for decades for the forest to grow back and then they can get any like alternative income. And they should be also, again, lucrative and replicable. Uh, next slide, please. So, oh, I'm sorry, can you go back to the, the previous slide? I'm sorry. So just to show uh, what I'm going to uh, show in the next slide is in, in this red circle that looks like just a forest cover, which I guess it is, but also to highlight that this, this landscape that we're looking at is a landscape where we are working. So you can see that we have been working with different types of agroforestry systems. Some are based on, we still have, for instance, monoculture, but we also have, have been introducing monocultures with trees uh, in order to show that, for instance, uh, soy, uh, uh, soy production, production can be combined with trees and pro producing all trees in, uh, increasing biodiversity. So in this landscape, you can see commercial plantations of pine trees. You can see native trees plantations. You can see uh, agroforestry systems with fruit species and then so on. So thank you. Next slide, please. So just an example of how it, it looks like in the field. We have here our restoration system. Uh, we have here uh, and how fast they are. So you can see the, the first top on the left, after, after 12 months, we have trees already like two, two meters tall. Then after 12, uh, 24 months, so two years, we already, already have trees, they're six meters tall. So they are, we're already pruning them, we're already harvesting some of them. By 36 months, we have already, uh, we have introduced way more species species like Yervamati and other native species to increase biodiversity and start increasing other alternatives of income. And then just to show an example, after five years, we're already 
being able to harvest trees for timber and other uses. As, and at the same time, we were already harvesting erva mate, which is the, the biggest uh, source of income in the region. Uh, next slide, please. Next slide. Um, so just, okay, yeah, next slide. Uh, so what, what we hope to achieve with all of this is um, really addressing some of the issues that Sebastian and Liat pointed out um, in, in finding ways to support traditional local knowledge and local practices and expand them beyond um, kind of the, how they're, they're successful at a regional level, but expanding them to, to a wider landscape. So what we're trying to do to make this transformation is to su support social innovation and produce value for traditional knowledge, the practices, um, and the products uh, that they produce. Um, because uh, it's not just uh, socio-environmental value that they're offering, but there's also a vast array of ecosystem services because of these traditional systems. Um, and it also improves health and well-being of, of the community. Um, and so this kinds of research can also lead to increased value of the products within the market as there's more knowledge about uh, why, these, why these products are important, why they're agroecological, why they're socio-environmental, et cetera. Um, we're also trying to influence, influence policy by creating an evidence base that shows uh, the importance of these systems on a landscape scale and the importance of recognizing and valuing traditional knowledge when it comes to uh, alternative agricultural systems, because this knowledge is generally inherent in communities um, and it should be valued rather than taking a top-down approach uh, to agricultural policies and environmental policies as well. Um, and so we're trying basically on the ground to implement culturally relevant and nature-based solutions to increase landscape bio biodiversity. Um, and it, I think that we're, we're um, I think that the culturally relevant aspect is particularly important. Um, and I think that this is what Andrew will talk about uh, next as well, um, because these systems have to be, make sense to the farmers that, that will implement them. Um, and it has to, to mean something to them in order for them to value. So uh, I think it, the, the image we have here of a, a gentleman from one of our workshops um, and on his teacher's t-shirt, it said, only we can write our own history. And I think that's important to support that idea that, they, that these community members um, have that autonomy and, and have that value in, in, in society. Next slide. So thank you very much. Uh, I hope that uh, you enjoyed our presentation. Thank you. That was fantastic, even Andre. Thank you so much. Um, there's actually a couple of comments directed specifically to you. So Yera Maria Maleros de Oliveira said that um, it's so important to show, as Eve has done, and Andre, the importance of very effective research results and congratulations. And uh, Rocio Bermudez Poses asked, which tree species are you using in productive restoration in Parana, Brazil? So maybe uh, if you could answer those questions. Um, and also uh, Ricardo Trippia just uh, pointed out that um, these systems help water and soil security uh, as well. And I know that Andre and Eve are very aware of that. So they just didn't have time to talk about it. Andrew, if you wanna get set to uh, go next, that would be great. And maybe if you could address the one question about the tree varieties, that would be super. Uh, yes, of course. So, uh, by talking to the farmers, uh, we have uh, listed uh, some species they, uh, they use the most and they would have interest. So they are, people are, are used to them and they know how they grow, which uh, makes the process of them uh, adopting system easier. So in that picture you saw is a bracachinga, is a mimosa, is cabrela, the scientific name, which is a legume tree. And we are using that species on purpose because it's a pioneer, very fast grow, uh, growing species. And it also adds, it also has the, the advantage of incorporating nitrogen in a soil like that is so, uh, so degraded. We're also using erva mate, obviously, and we're introducing uh, araucaria tree uh, as the three basic ones and others that the farmers might have interest in, in, in planting. And just to, to complement that, um, there's, through the, the work that Andrea is doing in the field, those agroforestry systems have managed to recruit 
Uh, how many native species? Oh, after three years. So we implement a system with one species first year. By the end of second year, we start planting in Ramati and other species. But more importantly, because after three years, we have a, for, a forest canopy, like 10 meters tall, uh, natural regeneration, uh, we observe more than 38 species naturally regenerating trees. So the effort of planting is reduced by creating quickly a forest canopy and letting nature to help us uh, increase biodiversity naturally. That's fantastic. Thank you so much for sharing that research. And I know that, as Eve said, there's lots of synergies with Andrew's work. So we're going to turn it over to you to tell us about what's happening in the Northwest Territories. Andrew, thanks very much. All right. Thank you, Allison. Uh, and thank you, uh, everyone, for coming today. Uh, it's my pleasure to uh, share with you some of the work we're doing with communities up in uh, Canada's Northwest Territories. Well, let's see if this works. It does. Um, so again, just a geography lesson uh, webinar as we get people from all over the world. So a little bit of a, um, a map of Canada's north. Uh, most of the story today I'll be sharing with you is work that we're doing in Kakisa in the Northwest Territories, uh, which is the home of the Kagitu First Nation. Uh, it's a community of about 50 people. Uh, so it's so small, it doesn't really show up on most maps. Uh, but this is a community in, in Canada's uh, boreal forest, and we've had the uh, wonderful privilege of working with this community over the last uh, six years, I suppose, on climate change adaptation and uh, food security work. Uh, it's just some lovely pictures of the place I'm going to be talking about. Um, of course, it's the boreal forest. It's forests and rivers and lakes. Uh, and here's a, just a quick snapshot of the, what the community looks like. Uh, and certainly a, a very beautiful place to uh, very beautiful place to work. So uh, Kakisa, like other communities in the north, uh, rely on harvesting, fishing, and gathering of traditional foods uh, as the basis of their food system. So foods like fish, moose, caribou, berries, um, everything that comes from the land. That, that's really how communities have survived for so long and continue to thrive. Uh, even with uh, the pressures of development and climate change and other socioeconomic uh, um, uh, barriers being thrown at them. So when food comes from the land, um, it's not only the food itself, but it's the relationship with the land and the cultural and the spiritual connection to the forest, the water, and the animals that are so important to communities across the north. Uh, and so, of course, land stewardship, environmental protection are really key factors in building sustainable food systems. And it's really no wonder that communities across the North are really leading land stewardship and environmental protection initiatives through protected areas and parks uh, to indigenous guardian programs where communities are out on the land uh, monitoring and doing research about how the land is changing in terms of uh, the impacts of climate change and other developments. Uh, so there's some really great stories going on in the north and communities are really playing an, an active role uh, um, in, in a lot of uh, biodiversity protection. Uh, unfortunately, that's not the story I'm going to tell you today and maybe that's for another day. Uh, I'm really going to shift and take this, uh, this spirit of what the, the northern food system is and really talk about an emerging part of the food system uh, for communities across the north, uh, which is really uh, local food production. Just gotta move this quickly. Uh, so growing food in the north is really seen as a climate change adaptation, okay? Um, it provides fresh and affordable food to communities. And of course, news in Canada is always around uh, the lack of, of food in, and a fresh food in some of these more remote places across Canada's north, and especially the high rates of food insecurity. Uh, but there are some issues. Uh, not a lot of people have experience growing food in the north. Uh, and there are some legacy issues around residential schools and some very negative experiences uh, with growing food across the north. Uh, but in spite of all that, communities are really uh, keen to try growing food. And this picture in the background is, is where we started in Kikisa, which is just a, a couple of garden boxes we started about six years ago. Uh, since that time, uh, we've expanded. And as you can see, you can grow lots of different food in the north. Um, unfortunately, uh, mostly green leafy things, uh, which aren't necessarily part of the diet. Uh, we found that uh, foods that are most popular and successful are things that go in a stew and really complement uh, more of the traditional foods. 
Um, but we've had some success at growing food and really engaged the community in being part of this. Um, so we've, uh, we, we expanded out of six garden boxes and, and this is our kind of potato patch at, at the back of the community. Um, but we've had an opportunity to really kind of reflect over the last few years to say like, okay, well, what, what impact are we actually having on the community's food system? Um, and really uh, not all that significant. Uh, the issue is that we're just not growing enough food. And so we've really had an opportunity to sit back and talk to the community about where are we going and how do we want to develop this so the community has this agency and, and uh, uh, provides the leadership in, in how their food system is developed over time. So we really had started having conversations about, okay, well, we, we have this very small scale. How do we get larger? Um, what happens if we scale up community gardens and our potato patch into small scale agriculture? Uh, and it began to, uh, I guess, it began a really interesting conversation about, well, what is the future of agriculture in the North? Um, currently, you know, there's only a, a handful of farmers. It's really a small scale operation right now. But as climate change takes away some of these barriers to agriculture, um, there are gonna be more opportunities to grow food. Um, but what does that look like, right? Uh, what impact does agriculture have on you know, permafrost, the, the land, the soils? Uh, what about the forest, okay? If communities depend on the forest, uh, what is that balance between agriculture development and um, the traditional food system? Uh, and of course, what are the impacts on water, land, uh, and even climate, right? Uh, the boreal forest is a, a very important global carbon sink. What happens if we cut down some of that forest, uh, which is a sink for an agriculture development, which is traditionally a source, right? Um, so how can we do agriculture differently across the North is some of these questions that we're having. More important, what land will or possibly should become available to grow food? Okay, these are all questions we're really kind of formulating and, you know, uh, I guess, <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm just throwing more questions out there, but this is kind of the spot, spot we're at right now, okay? Um, agriculture wasn't necessarily on people's radars even about five years ago up in the Northwest Territories. Uh, there's still not a lot of policy about how it's going to develop or what rules there are around agriculture. So we're kind of at the ground floor and it's really an interesting opportunity to start having these discussions uh, with a bunch of different stakeholders across the North. So really moving forward, these are some of the things we want to focus on as we start having more conversations around agriculture. So how can agriculture build resilience into the boreal forest? And of course, uh, even Andre, uh, our really wonderful example of communities growing food in an agroforestry um, examples of, of uh, supporting the forest and supporting uh, local food systems. What does that look like in the North? Uh, can agriculture help sequester carbon? Sure it can, but again, what does that look like in a Northern context? Um, are there opportunities to learn from others, uh, other places on how to grow food? Uh, I think that's the discussion we're gonna have uh, at the break. Um, but of course, yeah, the, the answer is yes to that. Uh, and then more importantly, how do we distribute, sell, trade, share food with others? How do we make sure food gets into the hands of people who need it the most? And I just wanted to share this, uh, this story quite quickly here about how Chief Lloyd Chico from Caquisa and I went down to Brazil to visit uh, even Andre and, and learn from uh, communities uh, around urban mate production. Uh, and we had a lot of really interesting discussions as part of that. So, you know, coming back to Caquisa, we sat down and like, okay, how can communities take care of the land and grow food? Okay, so speaking the language of the traditional food system in the Northwest Territories, that's all about stewardship and, and, uh, and taking care of the land. How does agriculture fit into that? Um, so really, how can we use the forest for food again and bring it more into the realm of this traditional knowledge, okay, as opposed to this other knowledge that's practiced, um, say, in the south of Canada and, and kind of bringing it up north? How can it come from a, a, a place of strength within the community and based on community knowledge and experiences? Uh, is there a more appropriate form of agriculture that fits the northern food system? Um, and I think uh, we all know the answer is yes, but again, how does that look like in, in, in the context of the north? So we've had a lot of discussions about uh, a food forest like demonstration. So figuring out the plants, uh, species that the community used to gather and how can we plant that again and cultivate that within the forest canopy uh, so we're not putting the traditional food system at odds with, with agriculture, okay? Um, and a lot of this stuff is just getting on, off the ground. These are a lot of initial ideas, but this is the conversation we're trying to stimulate uh, for communities across the North uh, 
to figure out how uh, agriculture can actually complement the, the existing food system and support overall health of the ecosystems. So just some things we're thinking about again, you know, small scale agriculture is of interest, um, but there's still a great deal of questions and a lot of uh, work on the ground we need to do. Uh, but I think this presents an opportunity to do agricultural differently. Um, of course, down south, we've made a lot of mistakes. Uh, why can't we, uh, um, you know, provide leadership in, in, in the north and in, in how uh, agriculture can be done right in terms of all the um, context of climate change and, and food security and all that stuff. So um, yeah, again, stay tuned. Uh, this is stuff we're just getting off the ground, but it's certainly an exciting time to, uh, to be part of this. But thank you. Thank you, Andrew. That was a, a really great uh, segue to our conversation. You left us with some really uh, super questions. Um, there is one question pending from one of our participants for the webinar that I haven't had a chance to get to yet. Um, that came up at the beginning of our webinar, and that is from Christine Daigle, and she posted the question to everybody. And um, if the panelists don't mind putting on their cameras so that we can see you, um, perhaps each of you can reflect on this question um, or um, whoever wants to take it up. There is a interest in around language and the way we're characterizing our shifting relationships uh, to nature. And uh, specifically, as we move from ecological services to nature's contribution, um, do we need to be careful about uh, characterizing how we characterize our relationship to nature and the kind of words we use? So for example, uh, pests who are, uh, as Christine says, are fellow members of ecosystems and are pests in a context dependent circumstance. So how do we um, build these relationships with nature so that they're more sustainable um, and and think about um, those kinds of considerations. So Liette, I see you've got yourself front and center. So if you want to take that one on, that's great. Thank you. Yeah, uh, and uh, hi, Christine. Uh, yeah, this is a, um, a very good question. And in fact, interestingly enough, in the past uh, year, uh, in some of our groups, um, even in China, we're talking about herbivores instead of talking about pests. Pests has hmm. been labeled because of uh, uh, agriculture, agri-food Canada, because of the agricultural sector and the industry. But when you think about that, these herbivores need to eat the same way that any other herbivores. And uh, the, the challenge is because, especially because we have monoculture, and this is where it's coming from. Uh, they are in higher number because they have suddenly a lot of food in one spot. And especially for specialized herbivores, uh, like uh, leaf hoppers and vineyards, uh, we work a lot with diamondback moth uh, that is um, attacking all uh, brassica. Uh, the problem has been that with the development of agriculture, and especially in terms of uh, the brassicaceae species, what has happened is that it has become uh, a global pest. And uh, to be able to, uh, to remove this herbivore, uh, people have been using pesticide. Now, if you take the example of diamondback moth, which is found everywhere except at Antarctica, this species is now resistant to all classes of pesticides. So, or insecticides, if we want to put it that way. So this is where people start to realize that, okay, we know it's there. We have just now to start thinking differently about our food. Uh, and this is why diversification becomes very important because at that mm -hmm. point, the, the, the herbivores has other things to look at. So, yeah, absolutely. Thanks, uh, Liette, for addressing that question. And I'm just looking at the time. Remarkably, we only have five minutes left. Um, I know, right? <laughs> Uh, but we did get a great question from Ferris Ahmed that I think would be a wonderful wrap-up question for everybody, but you're going to have to keep yourselves to one minute each. Um, Ferris says that Environment Day is also for telling stories about the lives and efforts of those who protect biodiversity and ecosystems. And we've heard some of those stories, so that's really helpful. Uh, I'm, he says he's yearning for more stories. Can any of you share a story of an individual or community group you encountered that inspired you? and who gives us hope on this day. So uh, perhaps um, 
Liette, if we start with you and then go to even Andre and then Andrew. Um, and Sebastian as well. I'm sure you have lots of inspirational stories. Maybe you can wrap it up. I'll put two very quick. Uh, Linda Greco here in the Niagara, who is an organic farmer and has adopted a lot of the diversification. The other one is, uh, and I forgot his name, is in Comanda in Ecuador, who has done pretty much the same than what uh, you have done, Andre and Eva, in terms of changing its monoculture to a beautiful biodiversity uh, system, and it's working perfectly. That's wonderful. Thanks so much, Liette. Uh, even Andre. Um, I guess inspiration comes sometimes from strange places, but we, um, we interviewed a young woman of 26 uh, um, about, she's, a, she's the daughter of, of, of a farmer who works with agroecological systems, and she um, told us that despite being told by her teachers when she was in high school that to leave or to be someone in the world, to be someone, be someone in society, you have to leave the farm. She decided that she was going to stay on the farm and continue to do the, the important agroecological work that her father does. And to me, that was very inspiring. And it really shows that um, we need to change the narrative about small scale farming and the importance of it in, in society. If, our if the children are being told that they can't be a, a valuable member of society as a farmer, then that, that's a big problem. And so we're, we're inspired to, to continue to do that work, to work with schools um, and to work in education to change that, that perception. Well, and it's very inspiring that that uh, young person is still in farming. So that's a great story to share. Thank you so much. Uh, Andrew, have you got a story that you would like to share as well? Sure, I'll be quick. Uh, none of the work in Kakisa would have been done without uh, Malene Simba. You know, there's, a, there's several young women in um, the Northwest Territories who are really taking leadership roles in protecting biodiversity um, and, and doing this community-based monitoring. Um, you know, um, Malene's been our research partner for years now. Uh, she, she's a water monitor, she's a fish monitor, she helps out all, all sorts of different things. And it's her kind of passion to um, make that change in her community that really kind of drives us and really feeds this partnership and this work that we're doing. Thanks for sharing that. Yeah, Malene is a really inspirational. So I'm glad that you got a chance to tell people about her. Um, Sebastian, I'm having a hard time finding you, but I think you're still on the call. I am. <laughs> okay. Do you have an inspiring story to share? I have a few because part of my job is meeting inspiring people. But uh, uh, when I last visited uh, one of our global geoparks, Tumblr Ridge in Northern BC, uh, I visited an indigenous nursery and I was amazed by the work they do to grow uh, wild plants. Uh, and, and it's very challenging and, and, I, and I think that they've innovated so much and what they want to do is ensure that they can bring back these species that are so important, especially for uh, our indigenous colleagues. So uh, they help bring those species back when they restore uh, uh, lands that have been degraded because of mining or forest operation. And this is, in my view, the type of model that should be uh, presented um, uh, in the world. We need to give a voice to the people who are making such a big difference at the grassroots level and ensure they get all the support needed for these initiatives to flourish and get replicated in other parts of the country. That's a fantastic example to end with, Sebastian. Thank you so much. And thanks to all of our panelists. It's been a really lively and uh, inspirational uh, conversation. I wish we had more time to discuss. Uh, we're going to be doing our first Spanish um, webinar in a couple of weeks. So if you're interested in getting information about that, um, let us know, I guess, maybe in the chat bar and we can uh, get in touch with you and give you the details for that. Um, again, thank you to our speakers, uh, Sebastien um, at, and Liette at CC UNESCO, uh, even Andre at Embrapa and Ponta Grassi University in, uh, in Brazil, and Andrew at, at Laurier. And also thanks to all our participants. We had a wonderful turnout and we're really grateful for your questions. And we look forward to hosting you uh, in the fall, if not before, for uh, World Food Day. So happy World Environment Day to everybody. and. Um, Thanks for, for being with us.